Here are eight tests that could save your life. In this video, I'll chat about eight different tests you can easily access that hold significant value for your health. And during this video, I'll also touch on tests that needn't be taken. As an endocrinologist, a hormone specialist, it's part of my day-to-day -to, -day to advise on tests. This way, I can spread the word to as many folks as possible, since not everyone has the chance to see an endocrinologist. So let's dive into the list. What are these eight tests? First and foremost, an extremely important test is checking your blood sugar, the fasting glucose level. This is a blood test that should be performed regularly as standard practice. Why? Because most often, initial stages of type 2 diabetes don't exhibit any symptoms. About 80% of folks with initial stages of type 2 diabetes report no symptoms. They feel totally fine. So, just because you feel good doesn't mean your blood sugar is proper. We already know that levels, even pre-diabetes levels higher than 110, are considered risk factors for heart disease. So, this test is super important. You're probably wondering, what's the blood sugar level indicating diabetes? Diabetes is indicated by a level equal to or greater than 126. That said, this fasting glucose level test should be repeated at least twice. There are also other tests to check blood sugar levels, such as the oral glucose tolerance test, where you consume some glucose at a lab and then have your blood drawn two hours later. This is also a valid test for diagnosing diabetes. Another common one is the glycated hemoglobin test which also diagnoses diabetes. Not only is it useful for diagnosing diabetes, but it also helps in monitoring the disease. Super critical. So the first life-saving test is your blood sugar test checking for diabetes. There's another test that needn't be taken. I mentioned I discussed this in a casual manner in this video, is the insulin test. And here, I mean, it needn't be taken as part of your regular screenings. Let's be clear, especially if you're not experiencing any symptoms. Why? Because if you're feeling okay, you don't need to investigate your insulin levels. Insulin results won't bring anything new to the table, but instead can confuse things more, as it's a test that's prone to error. I, for example, have never had an insulin test. Don't you think if it was important, I'd have done it? Of course I would have. So, no, you really don't need to do a routine insulin test. I know many of you ask about this. Second on our important test, it's the cholesterol test, measuring fats in your blood, such as total cholesterol, HDL, the good cholesterol, and also LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol. So what are the ideal numbers? For total cholesterol, the desired level is below 190. For good cholesterol, ideally, it's above 40. We know that low levels of good cholesterol are also a risk factor for cardiovascular diseases, like having a heart attack. And how about LDL? That's a hot topic, LDL. Is it really true that LDL is a risk factor? Like, the higher the LDL, the greater the risk of heart disease? Yes, that's true. What sparks debate is that your value of LDL, your bad cholesterol, needs to be personalized. Let me give you two examples. Suppose you're 30, athletic, never had a heart condition, you don't have diabetes or high blood pressure. For you, an LDL level of up to 130 could be fine. Now here's a different case. Another person, let's say they're 50. This person has already had two heart attacks, they have diabetes and are struggling to control their blood sugar, and they have high blood pressure. What should their level be? 130 would be far too high. For this person with really high risk, we'd want their LDL to be less than 50. So do you see the difference? For one person, 130 might be okay, but for another, it's way too high. So it really depends on your individual health profile. There's not a one-size-fits-all value for bad cholesterol. And that's a key point I wanted to make. It's a controversial topic online. And sometimes we, as doctors, don't explain this well. It really does depend on the individual. Like, one patient with the same LDL level might get put on medication with the doctor saying, their level is out of control, whereas another with the same LDL isn't prescribed any because for them it's in check. Now you get it. Another test that goes along with this that I'll group in this category number two is a triglyceride test. This is also a risk factor for cardiovascular diseases. But when your triglycerides are super elevated, particularly over a 1000, you're also at risk for pancreas inflammation, also known as acute pancreatitis. So you should also get your triglyceride levels checked. For that triglyceride test, Anything up to 150 is deemed normal. Even if you didn't fast before, which is allowed, the bar is up to 175, but preferably lower than 150. Triglycerides are a curious thing because you can see a major improvement just by making some lifestyle adjustments. We can actually get a really good response. So, limiting simple carbs, sugar, physical exercise, the patient begins to sleep better, drinks enough water, cuts down on saturated fats, and sees a big improvement in their triglyceride levels. I recall a patient whose level was 650 and by managing his weight and making these changes dropped to 120 and this happened just last month. Proof that changing your lifestyle really works. 
When we're talking about LDL, the bad cholesterol, there's a strong genetic component. We can manage to lower the LDL by up to 30%. The remaining 70% is a matter of genetic. I know it's a bit unfair, but I've got to tell it as it is. Number three are thyroid tests, and I'll discuss two of them. The TSH, or thyrotropic hormone, is produced by our pituitary gland, also known as the body's master gland. What's the pituitary? What is it? What a weird name that is. Well, it's a gland nestled within our brain, just to put it plainly, and it's responsible for regulating our thyroid. If you need more thyroid hormone, the pituitary gland steps up production of TSH. If you don't need as much or don't need any at all, the pituitary gland cuts back production of TSH, it might even stop altogether. A reading of 0 0.0001, even though it might sound scary, and it does scare a lot of patients when they look at that test, is not entirely uncommon. It could indicate hyperthyroidism. When the thyroid starts producing an excess of hormones, the pituitary gland takes note and dials down its TSH production. Did I make that clear? Leave a comment if this makes sense to you. Otherwise, I can make a separate video explaining this feedback mechanism. Now, what about the two tests? Can we say for sure only using the TSH? No, we can't. It's essential to look at another hormone produced by the thyroid, which is the free T4. Free T4 is very crucial and should be evaluated so the doctor can get a clear picture. Some diseases might create a little confusion, so we cannot rely exclusively on the TSH. There's also total T4, but it's not used that much since total T4 is a form of the thyroid hormone that is bound to protein. Because of this, it is subject to fluctuations and isn't truly active in our bodies. So, it's vital to always examine the free form. So about T3, Dr. Zhao, is it true everyone should get a T3 test done? No, it ain't. T3 ain't in regular checkup tests. But why does T3 exist then? That's a question you folks keep bringing up. It's only needed in specific scenarios, like for instance, when TSH changes with T4 still remaining normal, then T3 might be called for. Think of it as a suspected subclinical hyperthyroidism, for instance, but it's a real specific thing. So here's the thing, you can totally get a diagnosis from just these two tests, and it'll be pretty darn accurate. There's those thyroid antibody tests you ask about, like anti-TPO or even TRAB. Those ain't routine either, because they don't do much if you're feeling fine. But if Hashimoto's thyroiditis is what you're looking into, then those tests are absolutely the right ones to run. I've heard rumors about thyroid tests being out of date. Is that true? Hear that one all the time and see it in the comments too. You guys talk about it a lot. Somebody told me thyroid tests are outdated because in these studies they included sick folks. So these usually accepted values like TSH from 0 0.4 to 4.5. Some labs even go up to 5. Those values are supposedly out of date. Now that's pure baloney. Folks who got hypothyroidism, they're excluded from the tests just to get the normal range right. This was true decades ago. So there's a myth around, but it's been corrected for a long time now, so you don't got to worry. The lab values are current, no need for adjustments or corrections. I've seen all kinds of theories, even from some doctors not specialized in thyroid stuff. But you can relax. The studies are up to date and corrected. That ain't a thing anymore. Test number four is the kidney function, the creatinine test. It's a blood test that checks out how your kidneys are doing. From the creatinine result, we can estimate your kidney function percentage, see how your kidneys are holding up. So it's a super useful test. Simple, cheap, and should be regularly done. The two main causes for kidney failure, kidney issues when they can't work right, can't filter your blood properly, diabetes and high blood pressure, super common illnesses. Also in early stages like stage 1, stage 2 renal failure, most patients might not show symptoms. Those familiar symptoms like swelling, tiredness, changes in urine usually turn up in moderate to advanced renal failure. In early stages, many patients show no symptoms at all, so this test is really useful. Should everyone get a cortisol test? As an endocrinologist, I get asked that daily. And the answer is no, because changes in cortisol levels show symptoms. Therefore, if you're getting a regular checkup, checking cortisol levels isn't going to add anything. In fact, it could even lead to confusion. A lot of people get the test done to see if they're too stressed, but it's not a good indicator because it can vary a lot. And the test to check for high cortisol levels needs to be done differently. You need to take medication the night before, and during the morning, the cortisol level is then measured to assess the effect of the medication on the body's production. In some cases of tumors, this production might be increased, so this test is very useful for such evaluations. And the basal cortisol test can help in some instances of adrenal insufficiency where the patient is fainting from low blood pressure, experiencing hypoglycemia, or experiencing extreme tiredness, fatigue, loss of muscle mass, and even weight loss. 
which can often be symptoms of low cortisol, which indicates adrenal insufficiency. In those cases, the test is beneficial, but it's not necessary for routine checkups unless the patient has some symptoms or signs suggesting a change in cortisol levels, either higher or lower. Then, the test makes sense. Having mentioned low cortisol symptoms, what about high cortisol symptoms? These can include unexplained bruises all over the body, as cortisol changes can affect coagulation, large purple stretch marks, high blood pressure with an unknown cause, or worsened pre-existing hypertension, changes in blood sugar levels, obesity particularly in the torso, a fat hump on the back, lethargy, a tendency towards depression, or even worsening of an already existing depression. These are all factors that could make a doctor suspect a change in cortisol levels. Number five, this test really saves countless lives, which is a blood pressure test. When was the last time you checked your blood pressure? The term measuring blood pressure is also correct. A lot of people keep arguing in the comments about which one is right, whether it's measure or check blood pressure. Both terms are used and are correct. But answer me this, write down when was the last time you did? Because it shocks me when I talk to patients, to people. Many folks don't even know their blood pressure. It's been years or they're like, oh, the last time I checked was five years ago. And I never checked my blood pressure again after that. And it's a test that can really save your life. Because like the other tests and diseases I'm talking about here, high blood pressure in the early stages doesn't have any symptoms. Often the first symptom can be something like a heart attack. So it's really important that you regularly check your blood pressure. Once a month is fine, it helps. And note it down. Often people only check their blood pressure when they visit the doctor. But there's this thing, and it's real, all right? Called white coat hypertension. That's when your blood pressure only goes up in the doctor's office. So a person has normal blood pressure, but when they go to the doctor, it spikes. And that's actually pretty rare. That's why it's important to check your blood pressure outside of a medical setting. Sometimes you don't need to buy a blood pressure monitor if you can't afford one. You can check it at a pharmacy or even somewhere else that has a monitor. Somewhere else like a relative's or a friend's house that has a monitor. So there are several ways for you to check your blood pressure. Also jot down the last time you checked and write what city you're in, where in the world you're watching this video from. Number six, vitamin D. This test is super important because when vitamin D levels are low, sometimes the symptoms are non-specific or you might not have any symptoms at all. So you can't tell how your vitamin D is just by talking. That's why this test is important. What are the vitamin D values and how does it affect our body? Vitamin D is vital for absorbing calcium, for the body to maintain a balance with calcium. If you can't absorb it from food, if you don't have adequate vitamin D levels, then our body has to get that calcium from the biggest source, our bones. Oh, so that's why low vitamin D is linked with osteoporosis? Yes, that's right. We already know that vitamin D has several other roles beyond the one I just mentioned with calcium, like with immunity, for example. And what are the vitamin D values? Because I included a vitamin D test, not just because it can save your life, but also because it's a hotly debated test online. But it shouldn't be. As a hormone specialist, I can confidently tell you, based on protocols, and not just my opinion, that levels above 30 are generally enough. For some people, like young folks, who don't have any risk factors like osteoporosis or autoimmune diseases, levels above 20 are okay. And is it true that vitamin D has to be at 100? No, that's not true. And it could be harmful to your health. Why? Since vitamin D regulates calcium absorption, levels above 100, for example, could lead to hypercalcemia, meaning your body has too much calcium. And if you have too much calcium, you're at risk of having an arrhythmia, for instance. So it's really risky to just believe any video you come across online. Levels above 20 or 30, if you have some risk factors, are considered good for you. There's no evidence that they need to be super high. On the contrary, it's proven that it can be bad for your health. So levels between 30 and 70 are generally considered safe. Watch out for vitamin D toxicity. It's as dangerous as, or even more, than a lack of vitamin D. Number 7. Uric Acid This test is getting a lot of attention because high uric acid levels have been associated with increased risk of heart disease. What do high uric acid levels, or hyperuricemia, mean? In women, levels above 5.7. In men, above 7. The main cause for increased uric acid levels is kidney issues. Food-wise, it used to be called the king's disease, because wild game meat, alcohol, and processed meats all increase uric acid levels, and, as I explained, are risk factors for cardiovascular disease. On top of that, you're more likely to experience a flare-up of gout or gouty arthritis which can seriously affect your quality of life. So uric acid testing is definitely important. Number eight, and I'm a big fan of this test, is the blood count. 
which really helps us out in day-to-day -day life. Using the blood count, we can check your white and red blood cells and see if you have anemia, for example. It can also give us a clue as to the possible cause of anemia. If the red blood cells are small, it could be due to iron deficiency anemia, the most common type, so-called iron deficiency anemia. If the red blood cells are large, it might be because of folic acid deficiency or vitamin B12 deficiency, which is also pretty common. So, the blood count is an awesome test that helps us make some diagnoses. Did I miss any tests you'd like me to mention? Write in the comments and I'll make a part two. I could have listed a ton more tests, but I wanted to keep this video short, so I chose my top picks on a scale of zero, 10. How would you rate this video? If it's a 10, I'll make more like it. If it's a 10, I'll make a part two, deal? From where in the world are you watching this video? Which city? Let me know in the comments too. Now I've got a suggestion for you to watch a video where I discussed the best foods in the world. Do you know what they are? It's super important that you know I mentioned the best foods worldwide and the ones you can easily find. In this video, you'll find out what they are. Catch you next time.